evening, everyone. My name is Miriam Azim, and I'm an assistant at Improved Life PLLC. Today, we want to be thankful for you guys for coming out for our event, and I will be introducing our host. So, Stephanie Waggle is a physician and owner of Improved Life PLLC here in Reston, Virginia. It's a mental health clinic, and at the clinic, she treats adolescents, young adults, and women. Focuses include PTSD, anxiety, depression, relationship problems, stress, ADHD, and self-esteem issues. Dr. Weigel is also a mother, cancer survivor, author, marathon runner, motivational speaker, and teacher. So please welcome Dr. Stephanie Weigel. All right, thank you, Miriam. Hello, everybody, and welcome to three times three, sexual assault, reshape, rethink, re-educate. Thank you for coming in person and those watching in all the various formats online. So um, let's get some of the disclaimers out of the way. What I say here today is not medical advice and it does not constitute a patient physician relationship. And Improve Life PLC does not necessarily endorse the speakers or organizations. Remember, they're speaking from their own personal experiences, not mine or that of Improve Life PLLCs. I don't have any financial disclosures to make. No one is receiving financial compensation. And the event is being run on the kindness of volunteers. I would like to thank King Street Coffee in Leesburg and La Madeline in Reston and G. Ray Bakery Cafe in Centerville for donating delicious treats, of which you guys can help yourselves to them at any time. Um, when the speakers have finished today, there are some things on the tables over there that you can look at, and there's gonna be time to ask questions, um, but we have to make sure we're all cleaned up and out of the building before 8 p.m. If you want to talk to somebody longer, please use that time to get their contact information. Um, so one of the tables over there has copies of the research that I used in my literature review, and it also has copies of the students' research as well. Speaking of the students, I will now have them come up and introduce themselves in the school that they go to. Come on, guys. senior at Westfield High School. Hi, I'm Soraya. I'm a senior at Chantilly High School. Hi, I'm, my name is Mary Mazim, and I actually just graduated from VCU. All right, thank you students for your hard work, and their parents too. I see some parents here. Okay. All right, so this event is different than most in that it's going to focus on not how the survivors should change their behavior but on how the potential perpetrator should change theirs. I have a daughter, soon I will have a son, and so what can we do to make sure, to make sure that our children grow up and be respectful of each other's bodies? So before I answer that question, I would like you all to repeat after me, not all survivors are women, not all survivors are women. and not all perpetrators are men. So while you may hear me say men or women, that's a reflection of the research I reviewed. Male on female violence is more reported and therefore has more data, but just keep in mind that it could be interchangeable. The National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey is a survey that is conducted to collect the most comprehensive and current state and national data on intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and stalking victimization in the United States. The CDC created this survey to, to gather data on this important public health topic, and it was also created to um, enhance violence prevention efforts. This survey actually states that one in four men has had an unwanted sexual encounter in their lifetime, so I'd just like you guys to keep that in mind before I go on. So back to the question, what can we do to make sure our kids grow up to be respectful of each other's bodies? You guys might notice that there's some handouts um, on the table. So 
In the interest of time, I printed out a very detailed version of what I'm about to go over. Um, and then for those watching virtually, I'm gonna put this handout on Improve Life's Facebook page. So briefly, I'm just gonna go over four problems, four risk factors, and then I don't like to talk about problems without having a solution, so we're gonna have four solutions. Problem number one, rape supportive attitudes and hostile attitudes towards women. Risk factors include being the victim of or witnessing abuse and hearing gender stereotypes. For example, boys are angry and girls are emotional. Seeing violence and sexism starts to normalize it, and research shows that sexual abuse can increase the risk of future sexual aggression. So how do we address this risk factor? Report abusers before they have a chance to abuse again, and talk about bullying and abuse to your children so that they can recognize it, know that it's not okay, and know that they should go to a trusted adult. Try not to use all-encompassing phrases like, all boys are tough. Boys and girls can learn about their similarities and develop a social understanding by having interactions with the opposite gender. Problem number two, distorted perceptions and misinterpretations of communication. For example, a woman is friendly, therefore a man believes that she's trying to seduce him. The risk factor is that perpetrators sometimes don't even realize that what they're doing might harm somebody. How can we address this risk factor? Make sure young children understand that even if they have good intentions, the other person can interpret their behavior as being mean. While watching a movie, pause it and say to your child, how do you think that character feels right now? Educate older children and teens that friendliness is not always an indicator of sexual attraction. Make it very clear that sex is a mutually agreed upon interaction that's made when both parties are fully able to make decisions. Problem number three, alcohol use. Research shows that almost 50% of sexual assaults the perpetrator has consumed alcohol. Alcohol makes the distorted perceptions risk factor that I previously mentioned even worse. It also impairs inhibitory control and disrupts cognitive processing. Perpetrator alcohol use has been shown to increase the amount of physical damage done to victims. Risk factors include a biological predisposition to addiction, seeing heavy alcohol use in the home, and access to alcohol. So what do we do about this risk factor? The continued theme here is open communication and modeling the behavior that you want your children to have. Telling your children not to drink, but then appearing intoxicated in front of them frequently is not gonna work. Explain to them why it's dangerous to drink, and if you have teens, you should lock up that alcohol. Problem number four is pornography use. Now, not everybody that watches porn is gonna assault somebody, but in a meta-analysis of 46 studies, it showed that exposure to pornography has been associated with sexually aggressive behavior. If youth see a video where a woman's aroused during a violent sexual encounter, they might think that's realistic. Risk factors include, again, a biological predisposition to addiction. Yes, people can get addicted to pornography. The language that objectifies and degrades women that's shown in some adult films can lead to development of patriarchal ideology in boys and men. So what do we do about this risk factor? So this is not gonna be an easy conversation. First, decide for yourself where you are with pornography and keep in mind that your child may have access to it that you don't know about. Make sure your kids understand that these people in the adult film industry, they have regulations, they have contracts, they have agents, they're actors, okay? So the keys here are to have the hard conversations with your kids. Lead by example, model behavior, set boundaries, and be consistent with rules with your children. Thank you. Okay, I wanna take this time to introduce our next speaker, which is Wayne Promisel. Mr. Promisel currently serves as the supervisor of the Special Victims Unit for the Loudoun County Sheriff's Office. He supervises 10 detectives who investigate allegations of sexual and physical abuse of children, sexual assaults involving adults, missing children, and the various methods of exploiting victims through electronic facilitated means. 
Mr. Promisal is previously retired from the Fairfax County Police Department after 25 years of service. Welcome. Okay, good afternoon, evening to everybody. Um, <clears throat> oops, sorry. Thank you. I've been asked in uh, the time given to address again, reshaping, restructuring, re-educating what's in the mind of the offender. So to the degree that I can do that with certainty, I think is enormously impossible in 15 minutes. But uh, what, I, what I'll show, and if you wanna just do the, uh, yeah, yeah. Not, just the uh, title page for now. I just wanna take you through a little bit of kind of a uh, animated evolution of life model that uh, while being able to find, uh, follow Dr. Waggle helps in that she has outlined four problem areas. I'm gonna expound on a little bit of it because this more often than not is what we have heard coming from offenders or we have found within our investigations as they panned out and ended up uh, with charges and or court. Uh, so in this evolution, she did mention that one in five this number varies of, of males will have a, a, an, un, uh, an early life trauma in terms of a sexual um, experience or assault. One in three or up to one in four females will have one as well before the age of 18. Um, adolescence, while it can be wonderful and joyful and full of all those things that our kids are doing, it can also be, it's also a very cautionary uh, time frame only because of all the things that take place in that transitional period of time. Uh, such things as pressures, college, uh, transition, uh, psychosocio-emotional changes coming over us, uh, press, media, ads, it goes on and on and on. Fast forwarding to the 40s and 50s, uh, I couldn't come up with a comfortable uh, adulthood leading into pre, uh, not pre-elderly, but it's a midlife crisis. We have all those catchphrases and terms about it's a highly emotional transition in life as we move from our adult life into, um, in, into elderly age. So what does all of this mean? You're not going to, you're, you're, chances are you're not going to be assaulted sexually by the 6% of the population of a stranger. And I'm not there, to, none of my disclaimers are to minimize or trivialize what could happen. 6% isn't a big number unless you're one of the victims of that 6% predator. More often than not, and the point I wanna make here in my time is that you're more often to have sexual assaults occur in over 80% of the time with people that you know and trust, their friends, their family members, and it really covers everything from early life, child abuse, exploitation, all the way through adult and into, unfortunately, elderly abuse as well. So inside the numbers, again, to pick up on what Dr. Uh, Wago put out there is, okay, so what sets up the mindset? Alcohol certainly is, a, is also a mood um, re reduction agent, if you will. But there are the, uh, the studies, and I just wanna go through these numbers real quick, uh, as it relates to pornography at an early age. Just to give you a number, in 2016, Pornhub alone showed 4.6 billion hours of pornography that was viewed on its site. Um, the meta-analysis that Dr. Wagel talked about does show a clear and consistent correlation um, to sexual assault when it's repeatedly um, reviewed and, and uh, looked at. If you consider that study along with the studies done on violence where they bring in um, those adolescents or uh, those individuals that are caught up in gaming, the songs, the words of the songs, the videos, and that perpetual um, uh, repeated film, film loop, and you couple it all, it does set up a possible predisposition for individuals who might um, um, be involved in a sexual assault crime. 
Studies show that 93% of boys, 62% of girls exposed in adolescence. 49% of males were exposed before the age of 13. And teenage girls and young women are significantly more likely to view porn regularly than women 25 or over. So this isn't turning at the female and they shouldn't watch. It's just, as Dr. Wagle laid out there, this normalization, this desensitization, desensitized um, reduction in the emotions toward sexual behaviors is a, again, one of those elements that we continue to see in these um, offenses. Um, and then just to bring in the intimate partner violence in pornography, use by batterers is shown significantly to increase the odds two times over, and when it's coupled with alcohol, three times more often than not, sexual assaults can occur um, by an individual. And I'm gonna, when I get to the slides, tie all of this together in a model. And then finally, with the pornography, it's also an increased likelihood with alcohol included, that it will add or introduce other sexual partners, filming sexual acts without the victim's consent, and introducing other abusive fetishes. Once again, exposure to this stimulus is what has been seen, not in every case, but it does set up a predisposition. If you could go ahead, um, please. So, all crimes, if the next slide please. All crimes, regardless of sexual assaults, are based on the opportunity, the motivation of the individual, and the intent, all right? Here's what's difficult. On the other side, you're looking at people coming together. Normal, communication, uh, there's nothing wrong with the right side of the column here, but when you're mixing, the individuals that are making choices and doing things and the unknown person, which I've already said is 80% of the time, you're mixing with friends, friends of friends, relatives of family members that are known, you're more often than not to be assaulted by somebody known, trusted, or um, versus the unknown. Um, it goes back to the stranger danger mentality. All right, the next slide please. Okay, so what it boils down to when we take the mixture of the behaviors of parties, it's, it's not this picture of people jumping out of bushes and grabbing, it's subtle, it's communicative, it's um, in the mind of the offender. Looking at the vulnerabilities, just to pick up on Dr. Waggle's point about alcohol, all right? And, and I wanna emphasize right here and now, choices that are made, mistakes that are made, um, it's clear from the literature and the studies that victims after the fact always find reasons to self-blame. I shouldn't have had that extra drink. I should, have, should not have drank at all. There is no excuse. Uh, while your health might be affected by excessive drinking, there is no excuse for this individual taking the opportunity to capitalize on that vulnerability and it is a crime. Now, when we get into the court system, as this slide is depicting, it becomes really a reduction of, is it a crime versus consent? And that becomes a big circle of question and concern, where again, taking it opposite the way Dr. Wagle wants this to work, the victim is you know, saying, I really don't know if I consented. I don't think I consented. I didn't have any reason to worry about consenting. I knew this person. And it gets into that spiraling effect. This individual, more often than not, has assessed the situation, looked around, looked at the vulnerabilities, and attempted to capitalize. So from that, we want, and one of the messages here, I believe, is, and it's within her uh, lengthier, um, set of factors here, we want to report these abusers, all right? And that presents certain fears because you're gonna be judged, the victim is gonna be judged. If I hadn't put myself in that position, then I, this wouldn't have happened to me. That's a thought that we hear all the time. And we combat that with, as I said earlier, 
even if you were in that position doing what you did, there's absolutely no excuse and no ability uh, or no permission for you to become a victim of a crime. So what we end up looking for is this corroborative evidence. And you might think, and the victim has thought over the many decades, there is no evidence. There's not gonna be any evidence. I went there willingly. I went there holding a hand. People saw me. Um, that's for us to worry about, but in conjunction with the working nature of a victim who comes forward, has the strength and fortitude um, to enter the system, work with not only detectives, such as my detectives, but advocates, and the number, the plethora of resources that exist, it can be combated in a courtroom, all right? It's not a contract we bring out. It's a very um, sensitive approach, soft interview rooms, whatever the case may be, to allow a victim to present themselves and take that evidence and go out and attempt to prosecute these individuals and hold them accountable. Obviously, I look at things as there's only three 100% guarantees in life. Death, taxes, and change, <laughs> all right? You can guarantee that. Everything else is susceptible to a percent off and on. I can't sit here and tell you, uh, I don't look at conviction rates or what my success rates or closure rates, because I look at this, if there wasn't one victim come Monday and I could turn my badge in, I'd gladly go find another job. Now realistically and sadly in this climate, that's not gonna happen, but I would gladly turn it in and go find another job because one victim is too many. So this corroborative evidence incorporates all the questions and ability that a victim provides us and witnesses provides us in order to hold an individual accountable. In fact, ironically this week, as I checked my time, um, I was in a class Monday to Friday on trauma-informed investigations and interviewing where uh, Dr. Wagle would appreciate this, where the neurobiology of trauma was broken open to law enforcement and prosecutors as a way to bring out more information when the victim says, you know what, I, I really can't remember past this point. And this is, and then it jumps to how they woke up in the condition that they were, all right? And in past, and I wasn't just open to this, it's been happening my whole career, there, there are things, and trauma does shut down the brain, and it could get really physiological, the hippocampus and all of that kind of thing. But the questions and the openness now and the Virginia numbers of uh, prosecutors and detectives who are taking this into effect um, to help victims remember what they can't remember, and that doesn't make, sound like it makes a whole lot of sense, but that's what's going on right now. Um, so when I get down here to the bottom of charges in court, you saw I have a question mark because because you decide to file a report, a victim decides to file a report, we don't take out a contract and sign you up for everything that comes with it, all right? It is your decision, your collectively, the victims that um, come forward and want to do this. There isn't pressures. I get no more salary to work a case than to not work a case, to convict somebody or to find or exonerate somebody. And it is based on a totality of circumstances. And this is very important, almost on a point to end on. This is not a portrayal of what the victim's weakness in presenting them, his self or herself, to the courts that the totality rests on. It's the totality of everything, everything considered. Thorough investigations, thorough inquiries, thorough review of the information. Um, from drinking receipts and who was buying the drinks, to videos, to, to really what the society has opened up to us. And there is evidence in that. So, you know, la lasting comments here and questions to be taken later is that if, an individual is a victim of a crime and you're a friend of that victim or you are the victim, it is my recommendation that you definitely report. 
because even if nothing is done, there's a record, and I believe in what goes around and comes around, and we know from the literature and the history that these individuals don't commit just one crime. It's, what, it's because they don't get caught that they go on to victimize others. And I'll take questions at the end. Thank you for your time. So now I'm going to introduce our next guest speaker, Sarabi Kanal. Sarabi is a global advocate for women, who, for women who founded the Save Our Stars Foundation to raise awareness and initiatives against child sex trafficking, particularly in rural Nepal. She has taken her advocacy through multiple platforms, including pageantry and television. She was Miss Nepal USA 2019 and currently hosts her own show titled Social Justice with Sarabi at the local Fox 5 Plus station in the DMV as it is her mission to reach social change. Sarabi also finds it equally important to empower our young girls to reach their fullest potential. Please welcome our next guest speaker, Sarabi Kanal. Thank
So our next speaker is Dana Bandish. Dana is a survivor of two childhood sexual traumas and a military sexual trauma. She now shares her journey to spread awareness on this silent epidemic. Dana uses her voice as a survivor to educate others on many perspectives of sexual violence and healing. Dana is the mother of two adult daughters and a proud Mimi to two grandsons. And she works as a nanny for a military family in the Hampton Roads area. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, as she said, my name is Dana, and um, what I want to talk about today is choices. You know, Every day we make choices in our life, whether it's, you know, what we're going to have for dinner, or, um, you know, what type of job we want or where we're going to live. Like every day we make choices. And most decisions only affect our life, you know, when we're making those choices. But sometimes our choices impact um, and affect other people's lives directly and indirectly. In October 1990, I was... Uh, in the army, I was stationed at Fort, or excuse me, Camp Humphreys, Korea, and um, somebody made a choice that has now impacted my life for the, uh, and to this day. Um, I had gone to a male soldier's room for what I thought would be just me and him hanging out, drinking beer, and watching a football game. But when I got there, there was 12 other male soldiers there. I reassured myself that it would be okay because they were fellow soldiers. We were hanging out for about an hour when I heard the door lock and two guys block the door. And I was knocked to the bed. For the next hour, I was gang raped. And, uh, and then thrown outside naked with my clothes beside me. As I scrambled to get dressed, I was completely in shock of what just happened. There was a male soldier who came out of the barracks and he did not say anything to me. Um, he just walked me to my barracks, which I thought was completely weird, you know, um, where was he during this situation, but um, he just walked me to my barracks and didn't say a word, and I truly believe that he walked me to my barracks because he wanted to make sure I wasn't going to report it, and I wasn't, you know, I had two months left in Korea, all I wanted to do was go home and lay in my bed and cry my pillow till I got uh, to my next duty station, and that's exactly what I did. Um, um, I did not want the court case to hinder me leaving Korea. I did not tell anybody about that night for a very long time. I wanted to leave that sexual trauma in Korea. Um, that night, all those male soldiers, they had a choice they could have made. They could have made the choice to leave that room. They could have made the uh, choice to not participate or to stop it from happening. You know, there was 12 of them, so one of them could have stood up, you know. Um, uh, somebody could have went and got help, um, but none of them made those decisions. And because of their choices that night, my life went into a completely different direction. Um, I ended up still serving five more years on active duty, but I still kind of like, I kept it really down. You know, um, but at times, sometimes it would come up about my secret, you know. Um, but I left active duty after six years. I was able to go into the Army Reserves for eight years. I had every intention of, you know, serving 20 years in the military. But around 14 years, um, I just couldn't uh, deal with it anymore. I just, um, you know, all the triggers and um, flashback of were really hard for me to bear. Um, I felt like a failure because I did not make it to 20 years. But I proudly served my country for 14 years and that is what matters. Um, I got married and divorced twice, drastically searching for someone to love me and protect me. I had two amazing daughters during that time, but I struggled to be present in their life because I just was having such a hard time dealing with my traumas. Um, I was always on edge. 
I ended up not being able to work for a very long time. Uh, I had a hard time being out at night, um, being around alcohol, around um, big groups, um, especially in an indoor situation where um, I can't see the door. Like even if somebody's just standing by the door in my mind, I feel like they're blocking the door. So that's something that, you know, has impacted my life. Um, I would have fits of rage because I didn't realize, you know, or I didn't have a way to express um, what had happened to me. Um, I didn't know how to deal with the triggers. I fell into a deep depression where I would stay on the couch um, for days on end and just feed my two daughters Cheerios and macaroni and cheese for dinner. And that's hard for me to think, you know, that that's all they survived on because that's all I could give them at that moment you know because I always wanted to be the you know good mom but um, I think I did the best that I could at that time um, I was always on high alert you know I all I don't like surprises at all so you know I have to always make sure that somebody's not gonna jump out anywhere or, you know um, my family knows not to give me a surprise birthday party because that would not be encouraging for me um, after my second divorce, I made the decision to go to therapy and to heal from my sexual trauma. I have uh, been able to do a lot of healing over the last 14 years. Um, the triggers and flashbacks, they'll never go away. I have just learned how to handle and process them in a healthier way. Um, I have now been able to make some amazing choices in my life. Um, I'm now present in my daughter's lives. I'm, uh, like I said, I'm a proud Mimi. I love my grandson so much, so I'm there for them now, you know? Um, and that's what I, I feel like, that's why I decided to heal, is so that I can give my daughters a better mom, and I'm gonna be a great Mimi to my, my two grandsons. Um, I've been speaking about my journey for with others for the past 11 years, um, because I wanna give a voice to sexual trauma. I want to be a voice for those that can't speak for themselves, you know. Um, I also have uh, created a blog that I share my journey. Um, if you'd like to follow that, it's uh, from victim to victorious one.com. I do have some business cards over there if anybody wants to grab one that has all my social media info on it. Um, I have also worked as a victim advocate at the hospitals um, to be there for victims of rape, to be able to help them during one of the hardest days of their lives. You know, and that's what my healing process is giving me that opportunity that I can be healthy enough to help others. Um, in closing, if you ever are in a situation that you have to make a decision, remember, no means no. Silence is not a consent. If someone can't answer yes to, are you drunk? They can't say yes to anything. Um, standing, stand up for those that can't stand up for themselves. Don't let peer pressure destroy someone else's life. Take responsibility for your actions. Don't keep someone else's secret. In closing, um, if it was not for my relationship with God, I don't think I would be at a healthy point in my healing process. So I thank God for where I am now. I thank uh, all my friends and family who've been my cheerleader and helped me along this very hard 14 year journey. And uh, thank you to everybody for uh, inviting me here and allowing me to speak tonight. God be with you. speaker is a mother of twins and reigning United States of America, Miss Virginia. Found her focus in pageantry after becoming a survivor of domestic violence, sexual assault, where she began to tell her story to help others around better themselves and focus on the future. As an advocate for global developmental delay, she has been working with research and development to, te to help teach other parents about developmental delays, while also teaching herself ways to better help her son, whom also has developmental delays as well as serving heavily in her community 
with the practice of acts of kindness alongside the ampersand pantry project of Leesburg. Please welcome our next speaker, Tiffany Lockhart. Virginia. Normally under circumstances I do have a speech that I go by, but I feel today God is leading me here to just speak from the heart, so that is what I'm going to do. As Dr. Wagle and Mr. Wayne had mentioned, it is best to teach our kids starting young to know the difference of what is right and what is wrong, especially with sexual acts. What do we know about kids in all of this? They're innocent. And when you take an innocence from a child, their mindset and concept for the rest of their life is no more. They do not know what has happened. And that's what happened to me at the age of five. But what is sad about it is that, yes, it was a family member. But this family member was not an adult. This family member was only two years older than I was. And why was another child doing a sexual assault to another child? It goes back to what that child was seeing within their home. This child was also a victim. So therefore, fingers cannot be pointed at, though this child did do wrong, but it happened to me. And not only did it continue from the age of five, this same family member continued to sexually assault me till I was 13 years old. Nothing was done. My family knew, nor did I receive any type of hope or counseling I pressed on. Once in high school, we all get to the bright age of it's time to get boyfriends and girlfriends. And I moved on through high school where I have found my first boyfriend. And then from the age of 16 to 20, I continue to experience sexual assault again by the man that I was supposed to marry. I kept it to myself this time. I did not tell nobody. Though my family kind of had suspicion, I, I denied. Cause inner side to me, my self esteem was already gone. And that's something else that we also need to help teach our kids at very young age is self esteem as well. And that's something that was also left out to me with self-esteem. So yet again, after the age of 20, I started trying to find myself. I started receiving counseling on my own. And that's where I started trying to advocate to help others as well. I started going to local shelters, women's shelters in my area, started telling my story of how to better them to let them know that what happened to them was not their fault and they cannot also continue to blame themselves, which was what I did a lot of my time is I blamed myself. A lot of people, especially the women and their children ask, what are the signs? What if, you know, nobody mentions anything? Most common factor signs are low self-esteem depression, anxiety, stress, feeling alone. These are all things that everybody should look at, not just in women, but men as well. So I got married, had my beautiful twins, and where I thought that life was finally taking a turn, I experienced again another sexual assault at the age of 26. So at that point in my life, I moved to the fact that I felt like this was 
all me. This was something that I am supposed to continue to receive. Because obviously since it was something that had been happened since I was five, it was going to continue to happen. But why? That was an incorrect mindset to myself. I decided to go back to counseling and try again. I needed to rethink, reshape, and rebuild myself. And with that is now what I'm teaching my kids. I teach them about reshaping, rethinking, and building themselves properly. I want them to know the signs and factors of what to look for in others, not so much themselves, especially if it happens, don't hide it, come and tell an adult, anybody that's gonna listen. And then I teach them ways to know what is not right. We monitor tablet times, YouTube, internet, social medias, anything that is not age appropriate is big key factors. You wanna make sure that your kids are not getting into things and watching things that are very inappropriate. There is so much that comes across social media, YouTube, TikTok, you name it. The slightest little thing are teaching our kids misperceptions of ways that they're supposed to be. So now I want to just thank everybody for allowing me to come and speak about my life and what I'm trying to do to move forward. Also, I just want to make sure that everybody is aware. If you notice somebody that was once maybe potentially vibrant in their life or anything, and you're starting to notice depression, anxiety, stress, lack of self-confidence, anything, speak with them. Maybe something happened to them and they're keeping it inside. I have also lost friends due to PTSD from suicide because they held it in for so long and they did not receive the proper help either. So if you or you know somebody that is a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault, by all means, speak up. Speak out, get help, get help for them or yourself. Thank you. is Samantha Bono. Samantha grew up in Needham, Massachusetts. While a freshman at the College of William and Mary, she was raised at a fraternity party by a member of the fraternity, a stranger to her. Samantha spoke out about inconsistencies in the college's disciplinary system, which she felt attempted to punish her for reporting the rape. She has worked in collaboration with the organization Security on Campus and spoke about her experience on the TV show Dateline NBC. Samantha lives in Herndon, Virginia with her husband and three dogs. Hi, I'm Samantha. Oh, Mike, put down the camera. Thank you. Um, sorry. So, William & Mary, University of Virginia, a number of other colleges have a very strict honor code system. If you lie, cheat, or steal, you're expelled. But what they don't tell you is that if you rape, you graduate. And that's the experience that I fought while I was a college student in around 20 years ago. So, welcome to freshman year college. All of us are here from different high schools. I had no idea where people said they were from. So everyone was, was like, oh, I'm from Nova. I'm from Nova. And I was just like, uh. 
where is that? I'm from Boston. Um, and so you're so excited to meet other people. It's a new experience for everyone. And for a lot of us, we were also you know, exposed to fraternities and alcohol for the first time. Fast forward to Columbus Day weekend. Most people, all the people from Nova and nearby, they went home because they could go hang out with their families and their friends. A few of us out-of-staters or out-of-the-countryers stayed on campus. I was invited to a fraternity party with, um, with a friend from Rhode Island, you know, my other New Englander, and a girl who from Japan. Super excited, went, had around four beers across over the course of two hours. And then I remember getting really, really, really sick. And I remember being in the basement of this fraternity, looking at the old beat up couch there and thinking, wow, that looks so comfortable right now. I really need to sit down. So I did. And I passed out. Next thing I know, I wake up in a room I didn't recognize with somebody I didn't recognize on top of me having sex with me. In that moment, I was very, you know, I had read the books, my parents had told me, you know, all the warning signs. And I realized I was being raped. And so what did I do? Well, I felt like I couldn't move. So I did the most logical thing possible. I started asking the person every question I could think of about himself so I could later identify him. Okay, so first thing I asked him was the obvious. What's your name? He didn't answer. Clearly, he went to William & Mary. He was a wise one. What year are you? Oh, I'm a junior. Okay. What's your major? Economics. Okay, yeah, you might want to be doing some cost-benefit analysis right now. Not, probably not great to be raping someone. Where did you go to high school? I went to Thomas Jefferson High School. Okay, okay. How long have you been in this fraternity for? Oh, since freshman year, blah, 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 blah. And then I lost consciousness again. I wake up. It's the next morning. I'm alone in a bed in a room that I still don't recognize not wearing my skirt, not wearing any underwear. It was on the floor. So I went into investigator mode. You know, there must be something about this person in this room. This is before cell phones had cameras, but fortunately the, um, there was a schedule, a class schedule taped to one of the desks. And so I saw the person's name. I'm gonna use a pseudonym here, here John. Um, and so, okay, I wonder if that's who the person is. I walked home to my dorm the whole time thinking what the heck just happened because you know you're you can be consciously aware of something but not want to accept it I'm the loud outspoken person who warns everyone else about being safe and I'm the one who was raped so first thing I had to do though was figure out who the heck was this person so I went to the dorm room of my friend who was there also, and I, you know, I walked in and she's like, hey, Samantha, look like you were having fun last night or not. And I was like, uh, yeah, uh, I, whose room was I in? I think the person raped me. Her first response was, oh, was he hot? <laughs> Is that really how we, like, how we treat people in that kind of situation. I mean, so I answered honestly, no, he was ugly as hell. Fortunately though, I got a name. Next thing I went to my RA, told her what had happened. She called the police. They came, went to the police. Um, William and Mary, because it's a public college, the campus police are also part of the county police. So, you know, this is the real police apparently, not just campus security, so they said. I gave a report there. I had to write a long, long, long report. And so they just said, okay, you can go home now. We'll update you. And I was like, wait, wait, 
Like, aren't you going to collect some evidence? Come on, I did everything I'm supposed to. I haven't washed myself. I haven't changed my underwear. Like, I'm told this is what they supposed, what I'm supposed to do. So I said, no, we don't collect evidence. We don't have the ability to take rape kits here. You're going to have to go to the hospital if you want that done. And I said, okay, how do I get there? And they said, oh, I don't know, you know? And I'm thinking it's not walking distance. And then they said to me, Samantha, just so you know, if you decide to go and get evidence collected, you'll be required to bring a lawsuit against the person. And meanwhile, in my own lack of understanding, in my just turned 18, like, no understanding of the court system whatsoever, I thought, I can't afford this. I'm paying out of state tuition. That's bad enough. No, I had no idea how anything works. So, and you know, the police then said, don't worry, if you keep everything through campus, it'll be great, it will be fast, the person will be gone, you'll be safe. So I, you know, here's what we do, we trust people. And so I trusted the police when they told me that. So they said, yeah, we'll make sure the dean of students knows immediately, he'll get a call from them. Okay. So the next day I did what I was supposed to do. I went to the health center, got myself a morning after, well, a prescription for a morning after pill, which at the time wasn't over the counter, and then found out that none of the pharmacies were willing to fill it. I called pharmacy after pharmacy. Hi, I have a prescription for the morning after pill. Can you, no, we don't fill such liberal types of medicine. I felt like saying I was raped, like is that liberal, like, I, I, so, you know, fast forward, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm, I'm wondering when's the dean's office going to call me? Weren't they supposed to call me right away? Thursday, I decide I'm tired of waiting. I'm gonna call the dean's office myself. I call and I say, hey, I'm Samantha. I'm the person who was raped. I was told you'd be in touch. Oh, sorry. There were a lot of really serious things that happened on campus. Oh, okay. And so I, I, I think I said to them, oh, I'm sorry, my rape wasn't serious enough. And this kind of mentality is what makes it so that people don't come forward. If it's not taken seriously, then nobody is going to report it and numbers keep being so underreported. So, you know, you think, okay, things will be great at this point in time. So I go to the Dean of Students office. I was honest. I said I had been drinking. I don't know, but I think something might have been put in one of my drinks. First thing the dean asked, how would you know how much alcohol it takes? You're 18 years old. Oh, uh, okay. Well, then I guess I, yeah. Next thing the dean said, just so you know, we're going to be bringing underage drinking violations against you for reporting this. Do you still want to go forward with it? Yes, let's get this person off campus. Why is he still here? Well, don't you want to go to counseling? Yeah, I'll do that too, but can we also please get this person removed from campus? And so I started the month long process of going through the college disciplinary system. By the way, I had to bring the whole case myself. By the way, this student, his mother came down and sat in the room next to him and asked me what I was wearing that night. It's okay though, because he was found responsible. And so I thought, okay, great, great. Okay, now everything's gonna be fine. And so then that evening, the disciplinary committee came back in and gave his punishment. He was given contingent dismissal I, the punishment that I was told was reserved for, oh, when two people are dating and it's a he said, she said situation. Not for a stranger who finds you unconscious and decides that that means that you're consenting because you're wearing a skirt and because you're an attractive, overly intoxicated freshman. Nope. Contingent dismissal. What did that mean? That mean, meant that he'd have to take off a semester and then he'd ask to come back. And as long as he showed that he had addressed his issues with ethics toward women, he'd get to return to campus. Of course, he wasn't around to, um, he left after they said they found him responsible. 
I heard that he had a frat party that night that he didn't want to miss, so he didn't even stick around for finding out the punishment. Okay, okay, at least I'll be safe for one semester, I thought, but no, because there was still an appeals process. He was still able to be on campus and all of that. Fast forward a year, it's now September of the following year. Since this isn't part of my academic record at all, I have no idea if this person is going to ask to come back. I am freaking out, partially because I've only seen this person twice in my life, when he was raping me and at the disciplinary hearing. My biggest fear was, and honestly still is, that I would walk by him and not know it because I don't have a right to know where he is because this was never officially reported. You know, even though I thought going to the police should have done something. Okay, so what do I do? Oh, by the way, also, the school had told me that it was illegal for me to say anything about the outcome of this case. I was told that I'd be expelled if I told anybody what happened. Like, I, I mean, I don't know how that's lying, cheating, or stealing, but still, so, beginning of sophomore year, I had to do something. I wanted this person to know that if he chose to come back to campus, every person would know who he was. So I convinced the then student body president to give me the key to a locked box in the center of campus at William & Mary. I created a big poster that said William & Mary Rape at the top, gave a brief timeline of events, used both my name, full name and the student's full name and then said, do you want to rape us back at William & Mary? Keep William & Mary safe. I didn't know if I was breaking the law or not. I assumed I was, based on what the school had told me, but I had to do something. I also assumed the school would take it down right away, so I called the local news reporter, just, you know, the local Williamsburg press or something, because I wanted this to be memorialized somehow. He was like, sure, I'll, I'll do an article about it, Samantha. And so, needless to say, within three hours, the poster was down. Apparently, I was violating the law. Okay. Fast forward once again, three days. This time, I get the letter that changed everything. It was an envelope from Pennsylvania, which I, I mean, I guess I had driven through there before, never really went there, from an organization called Security on Campus, informing me that somebody in Williamsburg had mailed the news article up to them and that the college was breaking the law by saying that I wasn't allowed to say the outcome of the hearing and wasn't, a, and that I was breaking the, that, sorry, the college was breaking the law by refusing to let me speak about what happened. They then said, yes, we've already, um, we've already forwarded this to the Department of Education for a ruling, and we've already been in touch with William and Mary's legal counsel. I was just like, huh? Wait, I was just trying to make sure the person didn't know, knew that like people would know who he was. Needless to say, this time around, I got a written letter of apology from William and Mary telling me that they had the law wrong. But this tells us about colleges. How come their internal policies don't stay in line with what the law actually is? By the way, I learned that this student transferred to another Virginia college where he graduated. It's because, at the time at least, if you were found responsible for rape on a college campus, it went on your record as a disciplinary offense. His school record showed that he had been found responsible of a disciplinary offense. And that he had basically gotten a one month semester, but didn't say what it was. You know, he was a frat boy, like probably some kind of hazing or partying or whatever. And so until we address these changes, Nothing is going to happen. Now, it's always awkward for me. I, I tutor a lot of high school students, and it's really awkward for me when they ask me, so what did you think of William & Mary? Should I go there? Did you love it? All I can say is, it's complicated. I got a really good education. I stayed there because I felt like I deserved to be there, and this student did it. Did it. It's complicated, though. It's complicated that now, you know, I live in Northern Virginia again. I suspect that this student lives here also. I have no idea where he is and I don't have a right to know. And he has a fairly common name and it scares me. But yeah, that's my experience and I don't have a, a 
witty ending, but yeah, that's all. Thank you. is a licensed counselor and founder of Regain Your Voice Counseling Services, a private practice in the Northern Virginia area. Elena specializes in working with teen girls and women in a virtual setting as well as incorporating equine assistant, assisted psychotherapy in person at a local farm. Elena is also a survivor of sexual assault and is working on her first book, Regaining My Voice, due to be published in 2022. Please welcome our next guest speaker. Hi, my name is Lena Stevenson and I'm a licensed therapist and own a private practice in the Northern Virginia area. I am also a survivor of sexual assault. When I was 14 years old, I was raped by an internet predator. When I told someone the next day, I didn't realize that it would turn into a three year long federal court case in which I testified against him and he was found guilty. He didn't think what he did was wrong. That was something that was very constant throughout the trial and something that was very evident um, throughout the case. Many years later, when my mother and I were on a television talk show talking about the dangers of the internet, my mom said her biggest regret was teaching me to always be kind and polite, instead of, as she put it, teach me to kick where it hurts. That was the first time I ever heard her say something like that, and I realized in that moment just how much she blamed herself and wished that she had taught me something differently. I was reflecting on her statement recently and started thinking about how we as a society have traditionally raised children, especially females. Some of the classic statements speak only when spoken to, and children should be seen and not heard. And even if those words were never spoken to me, since it was the way my parents were raised, it was implied. I also grew up with an overbearing father, and speaking my mind or standing up for myself was not something that I ever felt safe doing. I was raised to be kind and polite and to do what I was told. Therefore, one day when I was in a dangerous situation, a situation I didn't want to be in, a situation that my gut instinct was telling me to escape from. I mean, all the alarms were going off, and I actually had a moment that I could have gotten away, that I could have ran, I could have gotten help, but guess what held me back? I didn't want to be free. That day, that learned behavior overrode my natural instinct to keep myself safe. I felt like my voice wasn't important enough and that manners outweigh my gut instinct. I have a younger male cousin, and when we were growing up, he would always hide behind the couch in the living room uh, whenever company would come over. And there are always rumblings amongst family members that, oh, you just need to force him to come out. He needs to say hello to the other family members and greet guests and give hugs because it could be perceived as rude. But my aunt and uncle, they didn't budge. They said, you know, he'll come out when he's ready. Um, and they didn't give in to the pressure at all. And sure enough, one day he did come out from out <laughs> behind the couch and you know, would greet family members. And that was something that always stuck with me. He was given that autonomy to make that choice for himself and he was never forced to do so. If we give our children the chance to feel confident judging situations and give them space to feel comfortable speaking up and using their voice, the likelihood that they will speak up if they're in an uncomfortable situation is going to increase. They are also more likely to speak up if they see someone else in an uncomfortable situation. Which got me thinking, prevention is twofold. On one hand is education and educating about consent. The other is fostering confidence in our children to use their voice when they are uncomfortable or witness someone else in an uncomfortable situation. Teaching consent at a young age is imperative and it's not just about sex. That doesn't even need to be brought up until age appropriate. Consent is present throughout our daily lives and interactions, and we can use those moments to help children learn. In addition to having a private practice, I also partner with another facility, and I provide equine-assisted psychotherapy. 
In those sessions, especially when working with children, we model what consent looks like when we're working with the horse. And in turn, the client will naturally model the same behaviors. Something as simple as asking the horse, can I brush your mane right now? Even before touching them with the grooming tool. In one session, a client went <laughs> up to touch a horse without asking first, and the horse quickly moved back. We talked about that with the client and asked them to reflect on what just happened and asked if there was something else they thought that they could try to get a different result. And the client said, I could try asking first. The next thing that happened was the client lowered their voice, looked at the horse and said, can I pet you? The horse turned into them and the client was able to pet the horse. Of course, not everyone has a horse at home, but the same concept can be applied and modeled in different ways. For example, with your own pets, you can model asking them before petting them or brushing them, or you can talk to them before putting on their collar. Something as simple as saying, I'm going to put your collar on now. Is that okay? Parents can also apply this to their children as well, asking them similar questions. Can I brush your hair now? Can I change your clothes now? This may sound silly to hear, but taking these moments to ask or to explain these simple things can convey a very powerful message of consent. With my daughter, I always ask her, can I have a hug or can I give you a hug? I refrain from saying, give me a hug. I also have to respect her if her answer is no or not right now. My hope is that if she is ever in a situation where she doesn't feel comfortable and there is a demand of physical touch made, that it will stand out as a red flag and she'll feel confident in being able to speak up for herself and get away from that situation. I want to model for her that it's never okay to demand physical touch from anyone. There is also a video I'd like to share. I don't know if that's yeah. pulled up. Um, I feel it perfectly demonstrates consent and it has a little bit of a unique spin to it. Oh, please grab food because I don't want to have to take any of it with me. I'm allergic to most of it anyway, so please take it all home with you. still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating hey. they go, oh my god, I would love a cup of tea, thank okay, you. Okay, let's start it at the Then beginning. you know they want a cup of If you're still struggling with
If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my god, I would love a cup of tea, thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Then you can make them a cup of tea, or not. But be aware that they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then... And this is the important bit. Don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you're entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say, no thank you, then don't make them tea. At all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes please, that's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying, as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea, but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind, and you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they're unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea. And they can't answer the question, do you want tea? Because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea, and they said yes, but in the time it took you to boil the kettle, brew the tea and add the milk, they're now unconscious. You should just put the tea down, make sure the unconscious person is safe, and this is the important part again, don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they are safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it, going, but you wanted tea last week or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat going, but you wanted tea last night? If you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you are able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to make myself a cup of tea. <laughs> someone 
if it is happening or if they witness it happen to someone else. After I was assaulted, I became hyper aware to all the jokes I heard about sexual assault from other high school students. Just walking down the halls, I would hear jokes or comments made on a daily basis. It was incredibly hurtful and made me feel even more ashamed for what I have been through. Comments about sexual assault are not locker room banter or just how kids talk. Dismissing bad behavior with old cliches sends a dangerous message. So we need to model to our children that it is not a joke, but something very serious. And hopefully, if they hear one of their friends joking about sexual assault, they will not join in and will also call them out and educate them. You can also use everyday moments for, or examples from TV shows, movies, songs, and ask your kids something to the effect of, you know, does that person look comfortable with this situation? Do you think that person just gave consent? That person looks like they've had something to drink. Do you think they're able to consent? By starting these conversations, it gets them thinking about things in a different light and also opens up the lines of communication, teaching our kids to be responsible for their actions and respecting the boundaries of others. And hopefully this will lead to a kinder and safer world. I want to thank you for joining tonight and being part of the solution. I have shared my story many times and I remember a friend asked me, how can you tell so many people about what happened to you? And I told her, because if it helps just one person, if it prevents even one assault, it's worth it. I'm currently in the process of writing a book about my experience and it's titled Regaining My Voice. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to e uh, reach out to me via email um, on my website. It's alinastevenson.com, um, especially if you want to continue the conversation of some things I mentioned tonight. Thank you so much. do another round of applause for our fantastic speakers. And we'll do a round of applause for the students. And speaking of which, I think it would be good if all the speakers come up, unless you're not comfortable because, you know, COVID and everything, to get a group picture and then the students come up and then get a group picture. And then we can answer questions and you guys can take a look at the things I was talking about earlier on the tables back there, the research that the students and I did. And then on each table, there's handouts. And like um, I was saying earlier, the, the four things that I went over, there's handouts about that. So we'll use this time now for the speaker picture, speaker student picture, questions, reviewing handouts, and very important, I don't want to see any food left here. So you guys eat all the food, okay? Eat all the food. All right. All right, who wants to come up for a group picture? Let's, let's turn this off. <laughs> Reese, can you take the picture on your phone, please? Thanks. Beeping happening. I've got my N95 on underneath here. Yeah, so everybody? You guys can get close if you want. <laughs> yeah, if you have your mask on, you don't have to smile. <laughs> yeah, I'm. All right, let me get over but here. But you smile with your eyes too. Nice, <laughs> nice. All smile. right, everybody, ready? Three, two, one. Got it. All right. All right. Oh man. <laughs> um, I don't like the wires. I'm sorry. I know. I don't either. This way. Yeah. yeah. I didn't like them the whole time. But, uh, <laughs> Wait, Mary, what else? Over there. Oh. I don't know. That could be all over there. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. We could like Photoshop the background. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the wires now. Is everybody in the? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we don't want the chair in the <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, we still got more. Ah. <laughs> okay, now some with the students. <laughs> we'll start with 
You guys say speaker Speaker Oh, 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 Okay, nobody uh, yeah, someone's going to have to like... <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm not crossing, so I would never get back up. <laughs> All right, there's no wires to be seen anywhere. Awesome. All right, everybody, <laughs> let's do this one first, and then we'll you know, proceed. Oh, we got more people going. Oh, in. wow, okay. nice. Okay. All right, we'll work our way from, from left to right here. <laughs> okay, everybody set? Ready? Three, two, one. Got it. Perfect. Ready? Three, two, one. Everybody looking? All right, sweet. Okay, now questions and eating and handouts. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. If anybody has a question, you can yell it or you can come up and use the mic. Someone says that they were blacked out is doesn't mean the case goes away. You take that, you put that to the side, but it's you know totality would be um, how did you get there? What was the night like? What were you drinking? Who was drinking with you? If somebody, if it was a date, let's just say it's a, an acquaintance, sexual, you know, who's paying for the drinks? So all of that leads to who, other, who else saw this person in the condition that they were in that could articulate um, what that person looked like maybe progressively. You know, really depends on the interviews, videos. Um, did it show a person being escorted out, not walking on their own? So the mere fact that they passed out does not eliminate an investigation from being done because again, it's not just the victim's interview. It's not just that person. We're trained to go out and look at the totality. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. And then I had another question. I guess that's more for um, survivors. Um, my question was just kind of how does your healing process look like? Because I know a lot of people just say to go to therapy, but my personal experience and with you know my friends and all that, sometimes it's hard to find a good therapist, and it takes like a few times, and there's insurance. Like there's a lot that goes into it. So my question is, is like. What are things that actually worked for you, and what did your healing process look like? And you can come up and answer if you want. Go ahead, I'll read. Um, I definitely agree with the whole finding a good therapist can be a tough thing. I remember being in the ther a therapist and her saying to me, "Now, Samantha, I know you won't call. You know, you you wouldn't call what happened to you race." And me saying, "No, it was. I don't question it at all." Now, Samantha, you have to accept that you're, yes, I do accept it. I don't question that. And so it really is about figuring out why are you in therapy? Is the therapist on the same page as you? And what are you trying to get out of it? For me, um, I think learning that I was allowed to speak about what happened to me was a huge healing thing for me. I never intended to be a spokesperson for sexual assault, but I don't really think anybody is until they're directly affected by it. But, you know, since it happened to me, I spoke about it. And for me, connecting with other people, explaining what happened and realizing that, you know, I'm not alone has been a really healing thing. That and singing and dogs and 
chocolate, and reality TV. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think for me, for therapy, I mean, because I almost didn't accept the fact that I needed to go to therapy until, like I said, my second divorce happened. And um, I was pretty lucky to find an amazing therapist the first time going around. Um, I was with her for 11 years before I moved from Ohio. Um, but we did many different types of therapies in a sense. Um, journaling really helped me. Um, nature helps me a lot to go out in, the, in nature. Um, I did the book um, Courage to Heal, um, which is a phenomenal handbook. But what's kind of funny with it for me is that, you know, I'm like one of these planners. So this book was like 250 pages long. And I'm like, okay, I'll do 10 pages a day or whatever. And I'm going to get this book done in six months. It took me three and a half years to get that book done because this book really dives into the healing process. It's not just, you know, draw a picture and you're done. Like it's, it gets to your core, you know, because one of the hardest they have you do letters in, in that book. And one of the hardest letters for me, it wasn't to my violators, it was to my dad. Because I felt like my dad should be, you know, I was daddy's little girl, so he should have protected me. So that was the hardest letter for me to write in there. Um, I've also done um, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy. I've done um, PE therapy, which that one is um, very, <laughs> I don't suggest that to the, Faint at heart. Um, basically, you go through your trauma every week for 12 weeks. And not only are you talking about it for 12 weeks, yeah, it's not easy. Not only are you talking about it for 12 weeks, they're uh, recording you, audio recording you, and you listen to it between your things. And it's more just to kind of get connected with it. And it was very hard, but I think that was my pivotal moment was to you know go through that therapy there was something else it's called what pe p yeah did i say pt i meant pe -E. yeah uh, prolonged exposure therapy is what it's called and it's usually between like 12 and 16 weeks and like i said it is not for the faint of heart and i mean i've done art and stuff also there was another therapy i was going to mention i can't think what it was but yeah so for me i'm the type that i'm at least going to try it once like if it doesn't work for me, like CBT didn't help me as much as PE therapy. But yeah, so it's been a long process. So yeah. And I have one more question for you. Yes, ma'am. And you're welcome to the same if you don't want to answer it. But my question was because I remember you talked about how like you went through like 14 years and like you had two divorce and all this. So did you think your symptoms from the trauma or like your um, like your re like, reactions? your trauma responses do you think it progressed and got worse as you tried to kind of just not address it or do you think it started rough and it would go down and grow up like I'm just curious about no, how for me I called it my monster in the closet okay. I kind of, have you ever seen the movie gremlin you know gremlins he's really cute you know so to me that's what it was in the beginning I just put it in the closet and it was fine but every time I had triggers or panic attack I was feeding it so over time it just became this big thing because basically my first husband i met him two months after uh, my game rate so i basically was just running to somebody you know to try and get somebody to love me and protect me and you know that uh marriage failed and then i basically just went to the next you know relationship so to me i think i kind of hid from it you know i just for 14 years i just went from you know first relationship to second relationship and when my divorce, my second divorce happened, that was just my pivotal moment. Like I'm here on my own. I need to get help. Like I realized at that moment that I basically had been running from my sexual trauma for over 14 years. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, my personal healing process definitely, like I'm sure with most people, very up and down. Um, it was one of the reasons I became a therapist because I experienced what having a crappy therapist can do. Um, right after the assault, my parents were told, uh, get her into as much therapy as possible right away. So I was seeing a um, family therapist, a individual therapist, um, 
psychiatrist, group therapy. I literally had something like every day of the week. And it was just too much, it was too overwhelming. And basically my only memory from that time was a therapist asking me, well, how do you feel about what happened? And I was like, 14, I don't know how I feel about it. I don't even understand what just happened. <laughs> and so I felt like that whole process wasn't beneficial um, at that time. What did start to help was going to group therapy and seeing other teens that have been through something similar and being able to share my story. Um, one thing that was really healing and helpful for me was photography. Um, I actually got my first degree in photography. Um, the dark room at my high school was kind of like my safe haven and all my teachers knew what had happened um, during the summer and so they kind of gave me a free hall pass like I could go to the dark room anytime I wanted. And so started printing stuff and started entering um, gallery shows, started winning, started selling prints. And so then I um, went to Academy of Art University in San Francisco and got my first degree in photography. And then through that, some triggers happened and I started realizing, oh, this is still something that I need to, to work on. And so I went back to therapy and um, it had a much more positive experience with that. But also again, group therapy helped a lot. Um, and then I discovered equine assisted psychotherapy, which was really beneficial, um, really just like in the moment, things that were coming up that I wasn't getting the same results as um, in the office. Uh, the other modality that was really beneficial to me was uh, EMDR. And that was kind of a turning point um, for me looking back. But with PTSD, it just it kind of ebbs and flows. <laughs> um, it's like even tonight, I originally parked like way on the other side of the building and my first thought was, oh my gosh, it's gonna be dark when we get out. I cannot walk that far when it's dark. I can, but I know my anxiety is gonna be up. Everything is gonna be kind of on high alert. Um, and so that's something that is kind of like a day-to-day -day thing. The other thing that made healing difficult was, was going through the court process. Um, I was offered EMDR at that time, but the attorney for the case said that I wasn't allowed to have EMDR because it would suppress some of the triggers and some of the memories, and I needed to wait until after the trial. And mind you, the trial went on for three years. So that was definitely uh, something that was very difficult. Also, the, um, the guy who raped me, he found me. Um, gosh, when was that? 2015, and this happened in 2000, so 15 years after. Uh, he started emailing me and harassing me. Um, he actually has tried suing me several different times because he believes that I was an undercover FBI agent <laughs> trying to entrap him because it was a federal case because it was through the internet, so communication crossed state lines actually in Virginia, which was the AOL hub. And so it was a sting operation to get him. And because of that, he believed that I was an adult to pretend to be a minor. And so I actually had the opportunity to confront him um, over the internet a couple of years ago. And that in itself was almost a healing process because I realized, at least from a mental health perspective, he was completely delusional um, and had such a skewed concept over what had happened. Um, and so that was a really interesting experience, but again, something that helped me kind of start to heal. Thank you. Well, these ladies have made really good choices and decisions, and everything that they said, it just kind of brings me back to my flashbacks, especially when I was in my early 20s before I decided that I needed counseling. And really what set me off to realize it was is I'd always did journals through my teenage years. And then I started looking that these journals was very thick. And there was just not small entries. And then I started noticing that people around me was like, why are you always so negative all the time? Why do you act like this? Why do you say this? Like, why do you say you're not beautiful? Like, I don't get it. Like, what's wrong with you? And finally, that's when I realized, I was like, okay, it is time for counseling. Like, there's something 
going on. There's something mentally wrong with me. And that's when I got the PTSD diagnosis because I had surpassed so much sexual trauma that I was just burying it in and just reliving it. And I continue to relive it. But what helped me the most was the pageantry. Because once I got into pageantry with my daughter, she was six months old at the time, I started meeting other ladies that was advocates for domestic violence, for sexual assault victims, just different type of things that they could use as platforms and run with it. And then I started realizing, okay, so I'm not the only one. I, there's nothing wrong with me. I just need a different approach about things. And these ladies, I have met so many different ladies through all sorts of different organizations, through pageantry. And it has been incredible because I literally went from hating looking at myself in the mirror, telling myself that I was ugly, disgusting, to walking on stage in a room full of people and a panel of judges in a two-piece bathing suit where I once was like, no, you're not allowed to look at me. I couldn't even, I didn't even like going to public swimming holes because I was just like, no, I, I hated the way I looked. But now I look at myself, I'm like, God made me the way that I am. He made you the way you are. And everybody is beautiful in their own unique way. And with that, I take it and I run with it. And that is what I strive to tell everybody. You are unique the way you are. Though I still struggle daily with my PTSD, my depression, and anxiety, it is a challenge a lot of days. And here lately, I've been finding myself just kind of sinking back in where I don't want to be. So I'm trying to like figure out, okay, what got me back in my hole? What do I need to do to get myself back out of that hole? So. They mentioned about good counseling, bad counseling. I literally had a psychiatrist tell me in 2018, two months before I moved to Northern Virginia from Southwest Virginia, that there is not a pill in this world that I can prescribe to you to make you feel better. You have to get out of your situation, move on with your life, and then if you still think you need medication, come back and we'll revisit this. But unfortunately, you have been on too much medication and nothing is helping you. December the 18th is when I moved up here in 2018. And that was my last actual therapy session that I had. And it's been incredible because not only that did moving up here open doors, but I met other people also, like I said, with the organizations and it has just been phenomenal. Like my whole mindset from where I was three years ago till now, people back home are like, I don't even know who you are anymore. And I'm like, good, because <laughs> that's the way I like it. <laughs> but I really, really, think back on things and it just really amazes me of how much stuff that I went through to where I am now and I thank God every day because I'm still here because I could have did what I wanted to do when I left that psychologist's office. I had every intention of going home and committing suicide and leaving my at that time two and a half year old babies without a mother. But I stopped myself because there was somebody else online telling me, come to Northern Virginia, I'm gonna help you. And that is exactly what he done. And I am so grateful. So thank you guys.
get on screen, unless you're shy. Do you uh, want on screen? I'm shy. Okay, you stay over there. I'm, I'm super shy because um, I haven't told you guys, but yesterday was my uh, work evaluation, and they didn't give me 10% just because I'm too shy to talk. So <laughs> now I'm trying to kill that. Oh, look, yeah. look at that. Okay, next year, 10%. Um, I am so happy to be here and listening to all the panelists, and this is such an amazing opportunity to be here. Um, and I have flaws too, so I'm just gonna start po pointing out flaws, not flaws, but one of the observations I made is that out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven panelists, four of us are, are a victim of the sexual assault. And before I say that, I want you I want to point out that all of four of them were assaulted by men. Any of them, right? So and I see in this room where we all are women. So next session I want to I want the organizational panel and all of our panelists and whoever organizes this event target various groups, men's groups, all the groups so that we're reaching the right community. Number one. Number two, if somebody's trying to clap, please don't. <laughs> it's gonna make it look like Miss um, Dr. Tiffany Waddle and the, I, I'm not trying to point for Another one I'm trying to talk about is uh, Miss Samantha Bono, my new hero, right? <laughs> I cannot imagine the, the characters you pointed out, the, 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 the administrator, the, the mom of the, the rapist, every single people, those are all responsible for the, the event you went through. We have to point, like, pick every single of those groups. I find every single of those people responsible. Even your friend who asked that, oh, was he hot? Why was that person not educated well enough to support you in the first place? Like, I, I was crying in my heart, in my everywhere, I was just crazy and I was making fists that I'm going to, not to <laughs> protect violence. <laughs> um, just like punch those people. Like imagine, like I've been in that position where I have been assaulted too and I went to tell this group of aunties, I'm from Nepal, I went to those group of aunties and I told them, auntie, this guy assaulted me and she just looks at me and laughs like, oh really? Ha ha ha, she has no idea what to do. So like, I don't know, like as we're still to this day, and I'm from Nepal, I was born, raised in Nepal. Back home, I got the same, same training, speak up, educate, rethink, and I come to United States, I get my bachelor's degree, and I come to this amazing event, and still we're talking about the same thing. So I don't know what to do. Another thing I wanna say, I'm bursting out for my, <laughs> yesterday's not getting 10% rate, but. <laughs> another thing I wanna say is that, like, about a small, let's say I'm gonna buy some Michael Kors back bag. We see the advertisement in Facebook, in Instagram, in Google, and everywhere. How are they reading our thoughts? We're living in a century where there is an AI reading our thoughts. So the quality of these events, education, like whatever we're doing with the sexual rape kit, like when was that happen when they were not taking your sample? That was like 20, 30 years ago, right? 2001. 2001, 2021, I'm sure the situation is still the same. Today, if somebody gets raped and go and tells like all the situation, the procedure of, I don't wanna be wrong, the procedure of like sampling, uh, asking question, who did this, what time, all those are same, they, they haven't been changed. So more thing needs to be done, not that you're responsible, but these yeah. things like just kills me in my heart and I just want somebody to point out the things that are wrong in our society, that's the things that are just not being talked. These things we talk every day. I was so happy to listen to all the, the victims, but but I don't know if this is enough we're doing. This is gonna solve the problem, and this is something that, that we need to change and start a different intervention. I don't know. I am one of those, I belong to one of those groups. I don't know, but, but this is just, I wanted to just come out here and tell everybody. I'm done. Um, <laughs> well, I can address the first part of that. It occurred to me that the audience that I wanted to target was not going to be the audience that's going to show up here. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> it's like, well, I think the people that are coming 
are very unlikely to assault other people. And I, I started to think, well, how am I going to get to the people? And, and that was a good point about, I had the, the little talk earlier about men and women, and you have to remember that there's exceptions to everything. But I, I infiltrated some um, moms groups uh, for our mothers of boys, because technically I'm now a mother of a boy. So I got into these groups and I was just like th saying things like, don't you want your son to grow up and be respectful of other people's bodies and things? But one of the things I learned, actually in that book that's back there with all my research, is that people don't want to believe that their kid is going to be a perpetrator, so they don't do anything to stop them from being a perpetrator. And in one of the studies I read, they interviewed the parents of bullies, and 98% of the parents said, my kid would absolutely never do that. So first of all, it's actually the last paragraph in the handout, is that it actually addresses the fact that you need to be open to the possibility that your kid could be a bully or be hostile or aggressive at some point in their life. I mean, statistically, most people both get bullied and are bullies too. So that's a good point. I wish that somehow the target audience would have miraculously shown up here in this room today. But if anybody can think of how to get the people that are actually likely to be the perpetrators to listen, uh, I think that would be good. Hey, you have an idea? Come on up. I'm going to offer something. Um, I show on Fox 5 Plus as well as they posted here. And with this platform, I would love to offer that platform to all the survivors that spoke today if you're willing to share your story on television. Um, we get a viewership of 6.2 million people. And with the audience that we're trying to target, I think that would be a better shot at targeting those people. So if anyone wants to, I'll go ahead and send an email out to the girls and they can help spread that. So thank, thank you. you. parts of what I went through is that the person who raped me, he didn't say, oh, she wanted it or she consented. He said she must have been hallucinating. Nothing happened at all. And I think more than anything that shows, well, probably what the fraternity told him to say or his awareness of legally, he was aware I wasn't in a position where I could give consent. And so the only possible thing he could say that would potentially get him a offer it is just saying nothing happened at all she was hallucinating and so <laughs> my whole process of also preparing for this school hearing was calling up my doctor back at home being like hey dr singer can you please send me something on medical letterhead confirming that i do not hallucinate and he was like sure samantha <laughs> i don't really know but the other thing i wanted to mention is it seemed and definitely thank you so much for bringing what you brought up how we've almost given up on reaching the population we're trying to. I went through, I went on the internet and I started looking up rape prevention. And so I found consent condoms, which require four hands to be on them for them to open. <laughs> because obviously a perpetrator is always going to remember to wear a condom. Um, date rape nail polish, which turns your drink a different color if certain drugs are detected in it. A chastity belt, because that's how we should all send all of our kids off to college. And I don't know what this is, but it came up under Google patents for rape prevention, and it, it looks a little sketchy. But all of these are, fo are focused on things that females can do to avoid themselves being, to avoid being victims. And that's, but why should we have to prepare ourselves to be a victim. That's not like, I don't go out saying, ooh, I'm gonna be a victim today if I don't act these certain ways. It's not my responsibility to do that. Like, what a, so I just wanted to, yes. Sorry. Yes,
was listening today because we all did their part to prevent um, sexual assault in the future and to hopefully make some changes and stop some perpetrators. So, clap for everybody! Okay, and um, make sure you take all the flyers and the handouts and literally like take the jugs of coffee and like take them with you, okay? I would please, because I'm not gonna drink all that coffee. I'm probably going to go to bed in about 15 minutes. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey,